We'll get started here. It's been a, about six minutes into it now. My name is Tim Katsouris, and I am the building official here in Culver City, Community Development Department, Division of uh, Building and Safety. We're here, <clears throat> we're here today to continue the policy development and adoption efforts for the city's first local energy reach code. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. It's important to harness the power of knowledge in our community to inform future policies, pri uh, possibilities, and priorities. The vision is for this engagement meeting to help create and prioritize policies and actions related to electrification reach codes for new buildings. At a high level, the day is focused on hearing your suggestions related to potential policy directions for the upcoming building code cycle. With that, I'll now pass it to our meeting facilitators, principal in charge of this project from ID360, Melanie Jacobson, and her project manager from ID360, Layla Silver. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Melanie Jacobson. I'm the principal in charge for the project. We also have Layla Silver on the line who will be diving into some of the details uh, of the project uh, shortly. Uh, just a uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, there's uh, there will be a Q and A session after the presentation, so please hold your questions until then. Um, you can submit questions via the chat function um, in real time if you if you wish. Uh, and then once we get to the Q and A session, um, please use the hand raising function if you have a question or if you want to share some feedback um, in real time during the Q and A. Also, feel free to use your phone or tablet uh, to scan the QR code on this slide to access the presentation materials and other supplemental resources on the city's reach code uh, development page. Okay, uh, moving to our agenda uh, for the community engagement meeting, we'd like to set the stage for today's uh, engagement meeting by sharing the city's uh, commitment to sustainability initiatives and introduce some key priorities that are directly tied to reach codes and building electrification. And before we present the electrification reach code policy and discussion, what we'd like to provide a brief background on reach codes and what they are. We'll, dive, we'll then dive into the introduction to electrification to lay the foundation of the reach code policy approaches that we'll, we'll be reviewing today. And then we'll also highlight some of the changes on the horizon with the 2022 building code cycle update and particularly uh, with the energy, the California energy code. After that, we'll focus on the statewide reach code program initiatives um, with a review of some of the activities happening right now at the state level related to this subject. At that point, we'll move into the Q and a discussion portion of the meeting and wrap up with next steps um, that the city is taking. Uh, next slide. So just briefly, our objectives for the engagement meeting today is really to provide that educational background on energy reach codes for you. Um, review the energy reach code adoption process. Um, respond to your questions and gather your comments regarding the local energy reach code code approaches that the city is considering. And lastly, we'll share the next steps that the city will be taking um, for the reach code uh, policy process. So, with that, um, I'll now pass it to uh, Layla Silver to dive into the sustainability initiatives. Thanks, Melanie. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, as Melanie just mentioned, we'd like to kind of set the stage first by talking about some of the initiatives that the city um, is taking and has been taking uh, to lead up to this moment. So uh, the city of Culver City remains a regional leader in its commitment to sustainability. Uh, back in 2007, the city signed on to the US Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement. And then in 2017, the city joined the Mayor's National Climate Action Agenda. Now in 2009, the city actually adopted a green building program to address climate change, um, specifically through smart green building practices for new construction projects, new additions, as well as major renovations. Now, phase one of the city's reach code efforts actually went 
into effect last year in 2021. Um, and some of the green building measures that were addressed at that time included light pollution reduction, water use, looking at construction waste reduction efforts, um, shower facilities for bicycle parking, um, as well as defensible space in wildland urban interface areas. Now, additionally, Culver City has joined the Clean Power Alliance, or CPA, which is a community choice aggregation that was formed to deliver power generated by renewable sources. Um, and on top of that, the city also maintains a platinum level leadership in Southern California Edison's energy leader partnership mode, um, which basically saw that the city reduced energy consumption by over 28% since 2006. Now, a big driver of all of these policies is really to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to support climate change action. Now we're gonna get into some background details on REACH codes. So globally and domestically, um, especially here in California, you know, our communities are experiencing rapidly changing economics and policies related to climate action, as well as implementation. Now, the reality of climate change impacts here in California have become more and more intense. Um, after each year, we experience more extreme weather conditions, uh, wildfires, coastal erosion, and sea level rise, for example, um, have really increased over the years. And recent national and state level policies have looked at shifting the role of government in mitigating the effects of climate change. Now, we don't have time in our uh, time together today to cover all of the climate action related legislation. Um, but, you know, this really ranges from President Biden calling for a government wide approach to climate change um, down to executive orders that are issued here in the state of California, um, including carbon neutrality by 2045, um, as well as the executive order looking at 100% of in-state sales of new passenger cars and trucks to be zero emission by 2035. So it's really safe to say that climate change policy and action is here to stay. And due to these evolving regulatory efforts and climate preservation occurring at all these different levels of government from state down to the local governments here, um, California jurisdictions are adopting local building electrification um, as well as electric vehicle charging infrastructure reach codes in support of these climate goals. So, you know, one of the first questions that typically comes to mind is why? Why REACH codes? Now, there are numerous reasons why California jurisdictions are exploring and adopting REACH codes. Um, but one of the first kind of, you know, reasons behind this is that REACH codes directly support local policy goals that might live in a city's sustainability implementation plan or a climate action plan. Now, there are numerous benefits that are attributed to local energy reach codes as well, um, including savings on energy and, you know, going a bit further, depending on the type of reach code um, that may also extend to money saved over time related to operations um, and utility costs. Now, reach codes also, you know, at the heart contribute to efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, really through design that considers energy efficiency as well as the fuel type in that building. Now, again, uh, going back to climate action plans, many cities have a climate action plan element um, that includes strategies that promote increasing energy efficiency um, in new residential and commercial buildings. Um, and Culver City is not alone in this effort. So there are really a lot of strategies taking place at the statewide level and the local level that really aim to increase incentives as well as policy measures um, that are looking at building electric or building decarbonization. And most of these California cities, right, have these strategies incorporated, um, really aimed at, again, getting to those climate goals um, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions on a local level to really support the regional and statewide level efforts that are taking place at this time. Now, another common question is, what is a REACH code? 
Now, reach codes are adopted locally um, and they will vary by jurisdiction. Uh, so not every reach code is the same. Um, it can be as unique as every city or town is unique, but there are some basic fundamentals of reach codes that really remain unchanged depending on the type of reach code. Now, some folks on this call may be familiar with the California statewide building code. Um, that statewide code is updated every three years on a triennial basis. Um, and we're actually looking forward to the 2022 code, um, which will take effect on January 1st, 2023. Now, reach codes can be amendments to various parts of the overall building code, um, but they tend to focus primarily on two parts of the building code. Uh, the first is the California Energy Code or Title 24 Part 6. And then the second is the California Building Code, also known as Cal Green or Title 24 Part 11. Now, all reach codes are voluntary codes that a jurisdiction locally adopts. So it, in essence, reaches beyond baseline state requirements. Um, and it really basically just means that the local governments that adopt reach codes are requiring something in addition to the requirements that are outlined in the statewide building code. Now, amendments to the energy uh, code are uh, based on local prototypes that are built within California Energy Commission or CEC approved energy modeling software. On top of that, all energy reach codes require cost effectiveness studies um, that outline modeling assumptions and results and also show that the reach code itself is cost effective over the life cycle of the building. Um, and furthermore, reach codes cannot preempt federal appliance efficiency standards or require standards that fall outside of the um, appliance standards set federally. Now, the slide that you're seeing here just kind of outlines the typical reach code process and the flow of activities related to reach code development and then ultimately implementation. Now, most policies typically originate with staff meetings to discuss priorities, identify goals, um, and shape the potential options that the city might explore. Now, all of this development is also happening in tandem with the statewide reach code effort, which we'll touch on in some upcoming slides. Um, the statewide reach code uh, programs um, and standards basically will create the cost effectiveness studies that support the local reach codes. Um, and they'll also provide some resources um, such as model code ordinance language for cities um, during this development process. Now, the city of Culver City has had some robust engagement meetings around this particular topic, um, starting, you know, all the way back a couple of years ago, leading to where we are now. Um, and typically, local stakeholder input is a really important uh, part of this public process when it comes to reach code development. Now, all of this leads to ultimately bringing the reach code to council for consideration. Um, and then ultimately, once it's adopted, the reach code has to go through statewide agency approval processes uh, before it can actually be filed um, and enforced, usually by a target effective date. And for the city of Culver City, um, you know, the target effective date for this reach code that we're going to be discussing today is in line with the 2022 building code cycle, um, which again becomes live on January 1st, 2023. So now that we've reviewed what reach codes are, why we're looking at reach codes, we want to take the next handful of slides to introduce some concepts around building electrification, um, as this relates to the type of local energy reach code that the city is considering. So what is building electrification? Um, you know, this concept can sound a little complex, but it's pretty simple at its heart. So building electrification simply means using electric appliances and equipment, um, such as induction cooktops, heat pump water heaters, um, heat pump heating and air ventilation systems in our homes and our business establishments. 
basically electric appliances still perform the same job or service, um, you know, heating and cooling our homes, providing hot water for our showers, uh, cooking our food, um, but they bring about more benefits than gas fueled appliances or systems. And we'll take a look at some of these benefits in the next slides. So overall, building electrification has been found to offer many financial, health, and environmental benefits. Um, electric appliances are typically better for indoor air quality, which is a really you know, critical uh, factor for our health. Um, in fact, there was a study done by the Rocky Mountain Institute that found that children going, growing up in homes with gas stoves um, may have an increased risk of developing asthma. So really switching to electric stoves, such as induction, can basically eliminate the invisible pollutants that come from burning natural gas indoors and inside a home. Now, electric appliances like heat pump water heaters and HVAC systems um, are also more energy efficient than their gas counterparts, which can help to save money and energy costs um, in the long run. And on top of that, electric appliances can also be powered by clean energy, um, such as rooftop solar or clean power options um, from CCAs like the Clean Power Alliance, um, which ultimately you know, brings that building up to a new level of decarbonization when paired with clean energy, as well as um, an electric, uh, you know, centered appliance. Now, when compared to fossil fuels, the benefits of electrification, um, you know, can become even clearer. So, you know, in addition to improvements to indoor air quality, electrification is currently seen as the lowest cost lowest risk way to achieve a carbon free source of energy. And there have been a couple of studies that, um, you know, really look at this and uh, support the path forward to achieving carbon free buildings, um, as well as vehicles in the future. Now, um, on top of the indoor air quality and the carbon free benefits to building electrification when paired with renewable energy sources, um, there has also been a lot of uh, studies coming out recently that show that job creation can also be gained through building electrification. Um, there are a couple of studies through UMass and UCLA um, that really see that the uh, jobs that will result from electrification and moving towards electrification will outweigh the job losses um, that happen once this transi transition takes place. And furthermore, um, you know, the state of California's recently proposed budget this year also included about $65 million proposed for displaced oil and gas workers, um, whether that includes well capping tra training or funding even for early retirement. So all of this to say that this is really being considered and being planned at the statewide level. Um, and there's a lot of efforts happening to support this transition um, as local governments start to, you know, adopt these electrification reach codes more and more. Now, because the purpose is to electrify our buildings, we also need to understand where California's current gas usage is. So um, the two graphs that you're seeing here really show that our gas usage is predominantly in the water heating and space heating sectors for both residential and non-residential building stocks. Um, as you can see on the residential side, this is followed by cooking and then pool heating, um, and then lastly, clothes drying. While on the non-residential side, um, after space heating and water heating, cooking is the third highest use, and then there's miscellaneous uh, uses as well. Now, luckily, all electric buildings are already the majority of new construction homes built nationally. So 60% of new construction homes in the United States actually use electric space heating already. 
Um, now, at the time of this uh, particular survey, about 40% of um, the electric space heating were due to uh, the use of heat pumps. However, we are expecting, particularly in California, this to change as a trend in the coming building code cycles. Now, nationally, 55% of new homes already use electric water heating, 62% use electric cooking, and 75% actually are already using electric clothes drying appliances. So this is all really to highlight that, you know, we have the technology, the appliances, and the trade knowledge to continue this trend and to evolve it even more and better as we move forward. So this slide that we are showing here just kind of outlines some of the appliances and the systems um, for residential and commercial buildings, just to kind of put images uh, to connect what type of systems we're talking about when we're looking at building electrification. So on the space heating side of things, uh, the slide is showing um, basically what's called the, a heat pump. Um, so a heat pump is a reversible air conditioner um, you know, where AC cools the air inside your house and dumps the heat outside, um, you know, the heat pump basically reverses this. It cools the outside air and brings that heat inside. So the heat pump technology has become more and more pervasive um, and has been found to be cost neutral compared to air conditioning. Um, and this is true for most residential and commercial applications. Now, also on the water heating side, there are heat pumps that exist for water heating for both residential and commercial buildings. And when it comes to cooking, uh, the preferred method that we're talking about when we're talking about electric cooking is induction cooking. Um, we're not talking about the really old school coil stoves. Um, now, induction is a pretty interesting technology that uses a current actually in the cookware, whether that's stainless steel or cast iron, um, and actually makes the cookware hot. Um, and you can actually see in this picture, um, the chocolate in the pan is melted, but the chocolate that is on the induction stove um, has remained you know, in its natural state. Um, and this is due to the induction technology. Now, there are commercial applications for induction that do exist, although the technology here can be limited in some capacities. Um, however, there are some commercial kitchens that use induction stoves, um, and this is really popular in catering as well because it does not contribute a lot of waste heat um, and can also require a smaller vent or even no vent in terms of infrastructure that is needed. And then lastly, when we're talking about electric appliances, we're also looking at clothes drying. So there is heat pump technology available, both residential um, on the residential side. And then in terms of larger industrial clothes dryers, um, we don't really have the heat pump technology quite there yet. There's electric resistance technology. Um, however, the industry is really making waves um, in the heat pump market for these particular commercial and industrial applications. Now, lastly, just kind of taking a look at equipment efficiency, since this is one thing to also keep in mind when we compare electric appliances to natural gas appliances. So on a kind of whole baseline level, efficiency of our gas appliances is an average around 80%. Um, so for example, if you have an existing storage um, tank water heater in your home um, that might be closer to 60% efficient where the newest condensing hot water heaters are about 90 to 95% efficient. Um, but when you compare that to a heat pump, um, the heat pump actually jumps about 350% uh, in efficiency. And this is basically due to the fact that heat pumps move heat from one place to another. It doesn't combust to generate that heat. And so because it's moving heat, like a refrigerator, this makes up for a big portion of the cost disparity that we have between relatively lower gas rates and relatively higher electric rates. And then lastly, we have resistance or induction cooking technology, where the maximum efficiency is about one for cooking and high intensity um, industrial processes. So we've now laid the foundation of what a reach code is, 
what building electrification is. And now we'd like to present an overview of electrification reach codes as a whole um, and some of the initiatives that are taking place at the statewide level. So some of the folks on the call today, you know, may be aware that there are numerous California jurisdictions that have either adopted or are exploring um, the adoption of a potential energy reach code. And there are over 50 California jurisdictions um, under the 2019 code cycle, which we're still currently in, that have adopted some type of local energy reach code. Um, and there are even more that are in consideration for the 2022 code cycle. Now, the approaches to these reach codes can vary, um, but there are some uh, themes that you'll probably see consistently um, with these reach codes, um, namely ranging from all electric only whole building reach codes, um, all electric reach codes that focus on specific systems such as space heating or water heating. Um, there's also something called electric preferred reach codes, which incentivizes um, electrification on a whole level, but does allow for some mixed fuel options, uh, but does require enhanced efficiency for those mixed fuel options. And then lastly, of course, we have electric vehicle charging infrastructure reach codes that many jurisdictions um, have either adopted or are exploring to adopt in this upcoming code cycle. So the slide that you're seeing here um, is just to highlight some of the neighboring jurisdictions around Culver City that have committed to some level of a reach code policy. So this includes, you know, Santa Monica, which had an energy reach code for the 2019 code cycle um, that included um, an electric per preferred pathway. Um, and they're currently looking at all electric uh, requirements for new construction. Um, West Hollywood had specific reach code requirements around solar PV and requiring cool roofs. And Ojai has um, basically an all electric design requirement for all new construction. Los Angeles County has um, basically standard cool roof requirements and the city of Los Angeles most recently, um, their council voted back in May to prohibit most gas appliances in new construction. Um, so this trend is really happening on a regional level in addition to across the entire state of California. So before we kind of hone in on the reach code pathways that are available for the city to adopt, we wanted to kind of share some of the highlights and the changes that are coming down with the 2022 California Energy Code. Because this will really kind of um, solidify more of where the state is headed and the foundation that these energy reach codes um, are built upon. So for 2022, the California Energy Code differs from the current 2019 code in a handful of ways. Um, so just on a kind of baseline level, the California Energy Commission has actually made heat pumps the prescriptive baseline, um, and it actually establishes energy budgets for buildings based on heat pumps for space or water heating, um, really in an effort to encourage builders to install heat pumps over gas-fueled HVAC units. Um, and so what this means is that for both residential and non-residential new buildings, um, the project's energy budget for space heating and water heating in certain climate zones is going to be based off of a heat pump system. Now, what this also translates to is a performance credit in the energy model for all electric design buildings. Um, and the performance credit um, is most noticeable in the residential building stock um, around three to 5% if you electrify both space heating and water heating. Um, now, because of this prescriptive baseline standard being based on heat pumps um, and because of this performance credit, the state's energy code is in essence um, an electric preferred code because of this performance credit. 
Now, on the residential side of things, uh, pre wiring is now required for any gas appliance that is installed in a new residential building. Um, so effectively, the code requires homes to be electric ready with a dedicated 240 volt outlet and space. Um, so those electric appliances can eventually be replaced um, uh, can eventually replace their installed gas appliance counterpart um, to really facilitate the future of electric appliances. Um, in addition, on the residential side, there are higher ventilation rates required for uh, gas stoves when those are installed. Um, so the minimum kitchen ventilation requirements um, for fans over cooktops will now have higher airflow to capture efficiency to better exhaust pollution from gas cooking and improve indoor air quality. And then furthermore, on the residential side of things, energy storage readiness um, for a future battery uh, when paired with solar PV is now also required for new residential buildings. This is going to include the panel capacity as well as um, the physical space um, to be included for that energy storage system. Now, on the non-residential side of things, in addition to heat pumps being the prescriptive baseline, one of the biggest changes is that new non-residential buildings will be required to have solar PV installed, as well as prescriptive battery storage requirements for select occupancy types. Um, so this will go impact wise for high rise multifamily buildings, offices, um, new retail and grocery stores, as well as new restaurants and new schools will all be subject to the solar PV and the battery storage requirement um, under the upcoming California Energy Code. So now that we've talked about the 2022 California Energy Code highlights, um, we're going to take a look at the 2022 statewide REACH Code initiative. Um, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation that the statewide codes and programs um, uh, team provides the cost effectiveness studies that support the local energy reach codes, um, as, as well as some resources and the model code language for all jurisdictions in the state of California. So just starting with this slide um, is just outlining some timeline updates related to the statewide efforts, in particular, the cost effectiveness uh, research and the analyses that go hand in hand together. Um, so as of right now, the preliminary cost effectiveness results for new single family, new multifamily and new commercial uh, buildings are currently published. Um, the final results are anticipated to be available at some point before the end of this month. So within the next few days, um, there likely will be an update in this uh, area regarding the cost effectiveness studies. And the statewide study, in addition to looking at particular building types, um, they are also for this upcoming code cycle doing a couple of analyses that are specific. Um, one for electric pool heating and spas, uh, which was a really big um, kind of topic area for some jurisdictions uh, who adopted reach codes under the 2019 code cycle, um, as well as a separate study looking at ADUs um, or accessory dwelling units uh, to specifically capture um, cost effectiveness when looking at at uh, new detached ADUs. So the cost effectiveness studies, as I mentioned um, previously, are really done to support the local energy reach code pathways or approaches that a jurisdiction can adopt. Now, the cost effectiveness studies are required for local amendments to the California Energy Code, in particular, when the REACH code requires an enhanced efficiency above the baseline statewide standards. 
Now, the cost effectiveness studies look at two main metrics or methodologies um, to basically demonstrate and justify cost effectiveness. So the first metric is what is called on bill, um, which looks at the individual consumer impact and uh, the utility rates as well to justify cost effectiveness. And then the second methodology or metric is known as time dependent valuation or TDV, um, which looks at more of the societal approach when thinking about cost effectiveness um, of that particular building. TDV is also the metric that is used within the um, statewide energy code. Now, the jurisdiction, so Culver City, will actually make the final determination um, as to which method methodology will be used to justify cost effectiveness. Um, it can either be on bill or TDV that is used. Now, furthermore, I just wanna kind of reiterate that REACH codes may not preempt federal appliance standards and the cost effectiveness studies themselves look at particular measures such as additional PV um, or going all electric, for example, and assembles all of those measures into packages. And the packages are what needs to be shown to be cost effective on a whole level. So the cost effectiveness studies and the initiatives that are happening at the statewide level with REACH codes um, basically are done to support some of the REACH code pathways or approaches that a jurisdiction can adopt. Um, and we'll take a look at what those pathways are in um, the next couple of slides. But first, we wanna just preface the possible REACH code pathways um, with just some of the basic kind of trigger points as well as some of the most common building types um, that the city is considering uh, for the purpose of the local energy REACH code. So the main trigger for the city's local energy reach code is new construction. Um, this means that existing buildings, um, including construction projects that include an addition or alteration, uh, will not be subject to the local energy reach code requirements um, that the city is considering for this upcoming code cycle. Now, there are certain building types that can be considered for the REACH codes. Um, this includes new residential single family homes, including accessory dwelling units. Um, now we're talking about detached um, new accessory dwelling units, uh, new multifamily residential projects, as well as various um, non-residential occupancy types, including hotels, motels, uh, new offices, new retail stores, um, as well as new restaurants. Now, excluded from this would be building types that typically fall in the H or I occupancy types in the building code, um, which can range from hospitals to institutional type of buildings, such as your, um, your uh, fire uh, departments and what have you. And then, of course, just going back to existing buildings, um, the REACH code that is being considered is not going to impact existing homes or existing businesses. So the table that you're seeing on this slide will be a big part of the discussion today. Um, so I just want to stress again that the REACH code policies um, that are outlined on this slide are being con considered for new construction only and will not impact existing buildings. So we'll go down through this table um, and break it down together, uh, but all of these um, pathways that you're seeing here are directly supported by the statewide cost effectiveness studies. Um, and these are the options that the city can consider for adoption. So there are kind of on a high level four main approaches. We have efficiency, electric preferred, electric only, and electric only plus efficiency. Um, and I'm gonna work from the left 
left-hand side of this table down to the right-hand side of this table. So for the first two columns that we're seeing on this table, um, they include pathways for all electric design as well as for mixed fuel design. So buildings that have the presence of natural gas and uses. The first item um, pathway here is efficiency, which basically requires all new construction, whether it's mixed fuel or all electric, to exceed the minimum California Energy Code standards. Um, you know, this particular pathway, um, of course, preserves choice where the builder homeowner would be able to choose either natural gas or all electric. Um, however, that building would be required to have enhanced efficiency above the statewide California Energy Code standards. Now, the second pathway here is electric preferred, which would only require mixed fuel buildings to exceed minimum energy code requirements. Now, this uh, pathway also preserves choice. You have the choice of all electric or mixed fuel. Um, it does come with lower anticipated greenhouse gas savings um, because of the mixed fuel option. Um, but again, it is a choice uh, that is available um, and does preserve that fuel type option. Now, the last three columns on this table um, are basically centered around electric only design. So we'll go ahead and take a look at these three approaches. So the first approach under electric only um, amends the green building code, also known as Cal Green. And it basically just requires that all new construction residential and non-residential to be electric only. Um, it does not require any enhanced efficiency above the California Energy Code standards. Um, and there were over 30 jurisdictions um, in the 2019 code cycle that adopted a similar model like this um, here in the state of California. Now, this particular pathway is not considered a reach code efficiency measure, but rather it's a building code amendment that establishes the type of fuel um, that would be allowed in the building. Um, and there are common exceptions around this particular avenue, which we'll take a look at in the upcoming slides. The fourth option, which is still under electric only, um, is the natural gas moratorium. Um, also known as the gas span, and it basically requires no new gas infrastructure, hookups, or piping. Um, now, this is seen as the longest lasting approach because it does not amend the building code. Um, it is actually an amendment to typically the health and safety code um, and really takes a different approach in requiring uh, building electrification on a whole level throughout the city. Now, the last option on this table is electric only plus efficiency. So at its heart, this just requires that all new construction is electric only, and it also exceeds the California Energy Code standards. Um, so this last approach really takes it up a notch. Um, according to the statewide energy code team, it is anticipated to have the biggest impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but again, it does only focus on electric only, and on top of that layers on enhanced efficiency requirements. So in summary, these approaches are the potential pathways um, that the city can consider for adoption for the REACH code. Um, so th this is definitely something that we wanted to kind of um, introduce here today and would like you to keep in mind um, when thinking of any kind of feedback, um, any challenges or questions that you might have when we're talking about the potential REACH code option. So, in addition to getting your feedback on the potential reach code pathways, um, the city really wants to hear about any exemptions to the reach code that the community is interested in. 
So the slide that you're seeing here shows some of the possible residential exceptions that are available for energy reach codes. Um, and this can include um, emergency backup power, uh, in particular, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, public safety power shutoffs, as well as power outages. Um, this can be a really important, um, you know, item that the community uh, wants the city to consider at large as an exception. Um, another common residential related exception is for multifamily residential building projects that have already uh, received approved entitlement before the effective date of the reach code. Um, they would be allowed to use fuel gas for water heating systems. And oftentimes for certain reach codes, depending on, you know, the needs of the community, there can be exceptions for new swimming pools and spas, um, fireplaces, um, in particular water heating or space heating in new accessory dwelling units, um, outdoor barbecues, um, and then of course, typical um, for any type of exemption is that when combustion equipment is allowed, then that electric readiness would be required, um, which also goes hand in hand and stays aligned with the California Energy Code's electric readiness requirement that is coming down the line for the 2022 building code. Um, now, it's also typical for all reach codes to include some sort of infeasibility guidelines that capture um, waivers for cost burdens or other technical infeasibilities that might happen to a project on a case by case basis. And then furthermore, the city can also exempt certain building occupancies, um, going back to some of the occupancy types that we discussed previously, um, and can also wrap up some exemptions around appliance types. Now, on the non-residential side, you might notice that some of these exemptions really remain the same. There are a few that are a little different. Um, one, including commercial kitchens that are located in a public place of accommodation. Um, that is typical for uh, an exemption when looking at all electric reach codes. There's also um, exceptions around hotels or motels that have um, 80 or more guest rooms uh, that can utilize fuel gas in on-site commercial clothes drying equipment. Um, and then some of our other exemptions that we just talked about can remain the same for non-residential um, occupancy types as well. So before we open the floor um, in our last kind of half hour together uh, for a, an open discussion on the information that was presented today, we want to just share some considerations and some permit data to help inform the city's current electrification reach code strategy um, and kind of help you think through some of the questions or comments that you may have um, based on what you heard today. So. As a part of the REACH code policy development, uh, the city took a look at some recent permit data. Um, and what was found was that the city issues approximately 35 new single family residential building permits every year. And looking kind of towards the future, uh, the staff also looked at some of the entitlement planning entitlement projects that are already in the pipeline. Um, so this includes one 150 plus room hotel, um, one new office building, one new four unit condominium, as well as one new mixed use building that has 82 residential units, as well as a retail space on the first floor. So, as we're looking ahead to the future, you know, the bulk of projects coming down the line in the city um, kind of range from mixed use and a couple of commercial projects, but a lot of the stock is related to um, these new single family uh, residential projects that are submitted for building permit. So, it's likely that these are the types of buildings that will most likely be impacted by some type of local energy reach code that the city adopts.
So the next two slides that we'll take a quick look at are just some of the reach code policy considerations um, that go into this development process and may be helpful to think about as we prompt some feedback um, that we're hoping to gain from you today. So again, you know, in terms of the reach code adoption approach, the city is looking at the all electric reach code pathway, but remains open to the other pathways that are available and is really interested in hearing your feedback on those particular pathways today. Um, the all electric requirement uh, would require all electric design for new construction with certain exceptions um, for new buildings, you know, within the city. Now, there are also some applicable systems and appliances that can be considered, um, you know, on a one to one level um, in particular when we're thinking about certain exemptions. Um, but typically the reach code will look at the whole building and the appliances and end uses within that building. So when we're talking about these all electric reach codes, we're looking at heat pump water heaters, um, the cooking appliance being induction cooking. Um, electric dryers, as well as heat pump uh, technology for space heating and space cooling. And other considerations to keep in mind would be the building types that are impacted. So everything from new residential buildings down to the new non-residential buildings that you know range based on occupancy types. So your offices, your retail stores, your restaurants, um, and then certain exemptions for building types. And again, um, you know we're we're talking about new newly constructed buildings. Um, we're not looking at existing buildings for this particular reach code. Um, and then keeping in mind some of those specific exemptions that we talked about. So commercial kitchens, also laboratories, um, the backup power using, you know, installed uh, permanently installed generators, and then everything from your swimming pool, your fireplaces to any kind of attached ADU or JADU um, would be considered uh, for a reach code exemption as well. Now, um, before we open the floor, we also just kind of wanted to share some of the common questions that came out of some of the engagement meetings that the city has actually already hosted um, on the electrification reach code topic area. Um, so we just wanted to share these handful of common questions um, and comments that were raised during previous engagement efforts. So, of course, you know, 1 of the 1st questions is, you know, will my existing building be affected? Um, no, the city is considering reach codes for new construction at this time. Um, another comment that was common was, you know, thinking about electricity costs more per unit of energy than natural gas and um, electrification resulting in higher utility bills. Um, and so just going back to what's going to be required on a statewide level. So, um, you know, already at this point in time, new homes in the state of California are required to have on site solar PV installed, um, which thereby results in either a net zero electrical bill or a very small electrical bill to cover any excess consumption. Um, and then as we look ahead to January 1st, 2023, all new buildings, so now including new non-residential buildings, will also be required to have solar PV installed um, along with prescriptive battery requirements um, as well. Now, other common questions that came up in previous um, outreach efforts was around cooking, um, in particular in an electric building during a power outage. Um, and, you know, the city does acknowledge that, you know, during an electrical power outages, um, electric appliances would be compromised unless the building is equipped with solar PV, a battery backup system, or an electrical generator. Um, and, you know, since all new residential buildings are now required to have solar PV, um, it, it seems that electrical cooking appliances would only really be compromised at night or on days without sufficient sun exposure. Um, and furthermore, another kind of consideration is that, you know, in a lot of existing homes, um, older existing homes um, are, and, and newer existi uh, existing homes, gas stoves in particular um, will have an electric ignition um, and also utilizing 
the ventilation system with a gas stove is really important for um, indoor air quality. Now, the last kind of comment here is that electricity is not a clean power source um, and that offsite power generation produces pollution. Um, and, the, and Culver City is you know, supplied by a high proportion of renewable electrical energy. Um, and a lot of the utilities are making moves to really um, kind of increase the stock of uh, renewable energy sources and clean energy. Uh, the California Energy Code you know, going back to the requirements at the statewide level, um, on site solar PV systems are required to be installed. Um, and furthermore, Culver City participates in the Clean uh, Power Alliance that delivers a percentage of power generated by renewable sources for all the buildings um, that are within the city limits. And lastly, what target building categories are most prevalent in Culver City? So going back to that permit data, um, low rise residential buildings account for most existing and new buildings within the city. And then lastly, um, you know, there have been comments about increased cost for utilities. Um, and this is really where those cost effectiveness analyses come in to demonstrate that if there is any increased cost associated with implementation of a local reach code standard, um, that the associated savings and energy costs would eventually result in cost recovery during the reasonable life expectancy of that particular building. Um, so those cost effectiveness analyses uh, really play an important role in supporting these local energy reach codes. So with that, um, we're going to just open the floor uh, for any discussion um, items that may have came to you during this presentation. Um, thank you for bearing with me. I know we just kind of, you know, presented a lot of information and um, you may be a little overloaded with that, but we do appreciate you taking the time to be here today and engaging with this presentation. Um, so. If you would like to say anything live in real time, please feel free to raise your hand and you'll be unmuted and um, you'll be um, able to uh, state your question or comment. Okay, I have Ron, so I'm going to mute you right now, Ron. You can go ahead. Oscar, thank you very much. Um, the question I have is, well, it's first set of comments. My concern is that putting such an additional burden on an already old electrical infrastructure grid is, is kind of dangerous. Um, power point failure occurs when you exceed the maximum amperage of a system. Uh, we have 70 year old infrastructure in our electric grid and um, we now have a housing element where the present city council wants to multiply the amount of homes on a single family lot four to 10 times. And that's gonna create a huge, huge, huge demand on the amperage system of our electrical grid. And the law of physics cannot be denied. I think you're gonna have a lot of PowerPoint failures in Culver City. What is a PowerPoint failure? It's as simple as plugging too many appliances into an outlet. There is no provision for additional electrical infrastructure in our housing element. And in fact, SB 9 and 10 require no contribution to uh, increasing the electrical infrastructure, uh, which is a state law. Um, when you have a, a PowerPoint overload, that can cause a failure of the electrical circuit and cause a fire. Uh, I, and then to uh, put all of this on, and then you indicated that you'd have backup if you had solar panels. You will not have backup with just solar panels because that just feeds the grid. And if the grid is down, your solar panels are not going to do any good. If you do have a battery, well, that'd be helpful. That'd be good for 24 to 48 hours, maybe. And a generator, uh, what kind of generator are you suggesting? A gas generator? That's going to create a lot of carbon as well. I don't know. I hope we don't go to an electrical only system because gas is one of the cleaner burning fuels. And, you know, 
we have lived so long on antiquated infrastructure, we should be building out the infrastructure before we we totally abandon uh, uh, gas, in my opinion. Therefore, one of the other uh, uh, grids uh, that include the option to um, put in gas, I think would be preferable to the city. But could you tell me about uh, how we're going to avoid PowerPoint failures because of over uh, use of the uh, grid and um, in, in terms of backup, if there's um, um, electrical failures, which I think there'll be more of over time. Uh, renewable energy is great, but it's only part of the puzzle. And sometimes uh, wind or solar is not a sufficiently steady supply to uh, do it. And I'm afraid if you if you put too much um, uh, demand on our electrical system, we're going to start falling into very bad old habits like burning coal. So um, I hope uh, I hope that's considered when we're thinking about the reach code. I don't think that we should reach the furthest. And I don't think we should do electrical only. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, next, we have Kim. Oh, can you answer my question first? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, um, Lisa, I see we actually have um, Josh Torres on the line, and I was hoping from SCE, and I was hoping you could uh, promote him to a panelist to uh, speak to some of those points. Sure. Thank you. Okay, I'll unmute him right now. Oops. Thank you, Joshua. Hi there, can everybody hear me? Yes. Hi everybody, my name is Joshua Torres. I'm a senior policy advisor with Southern California Edison. So I, I hear your concerns and it's something that, you know, is fairly common. Um, people think that all electric buildings are more difficult to serve, but uh, we actually have all electric neighborhoods in Fontana and Irvine that we've been studying for several years. And the usage patterns are different, but the demands on the grid are fairly similar. So when we design the electric grid, we design it for what's called peak load. And so typically, uh, because we're in California and you know our, our greatest time of energy demand is the summer, we, you know, we typically are designing for a, a hot summer, like what we're expecting over Labor Day weekend. Um, and when we look at what additional demands are being placed by all electric buildings, typically that increased load is happening at other times of the year or other times of the day. So when we think about all electric heating, that's happening in the winter. There's plenty of capacity on the grid. In fact, there's excess capacity on the grid. When we think about an all electric water heater, um, those are programmable um, to operate during off peak hours, such as in the middle of the day during peak solar production or in the evening, um, both times when there's uh, available capacity on the grid. So when we look at the demands for all electric neighborhoods, they're pretty similar to mixed fuel. The real concern for us is new load in general. So when we have you know, a new building going in, we just need the city and the developer to work with us uh, as early as possible. So that way we can make sure that we have the capacity on that circuit. But whether or not that is all electric or mixed fuel is of very little consequence. Thank you, Joshua. Um, okay, our next, uh, next person has a question is Kim. Uh, I'll unmute. There you go. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. I, I've been having issues with my phone. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm here to give a comment, actually. Um, so my name is Kimberly Orbe. Um, I am the Sierra Club Conservation Program Manager and a new resident to Culver City. Um, I just moved here three weeks ago or three months ago. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here today. Um, as someone who cares about the climate and environmental justice, I strongly support the adoption of a comprehensive all electric, electric building code for new construction in Culver City. Um, I don't have to name the reasons why. I think the presentations gave a really great explanation of why we're even talking about this right now, why we need building electrification reach codes. Um, so I just really wanna stress that you know, we know that over 50 communities across California have already adopt, adopted local building electrification codes. And LA City is one of those, as well as LA County, which I don't think was mentioned in that presentation, um, have recently passed a motion to do the same by the end of the year. 
Um, Culver City has been a leader in environmental policy and is really well positioned to take action to pass a DE reach code. I expect Culver City continues to be a leader um, by passing a strong local policy that limits exemptions and prioritizes implementation by January 1st um, next year. And I just want to make a quick comment that something that I heard was that um, stating that gas is a cleaner of burning fuels is that I think that's really harmful to be saying at this point in time. Um, personally, I feel like it's saying that there's a good type of pollution. Pollution is pollution. It's harmful. Um, so I really do think that we need to, you know, be ambitious. I was really happy to hear some really great things in this presentation towards the action that we want to be moving towards um, to combat climate change. And just want to share my gratitude to the panelists and for this presentation and the opportunity to make a comment. Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, the next person is Eric. Uh, we'll admit you one second. Go ahead, Eric. Eric, can you hear us? Hello? Uh, hi. Okay, maybe it's not. Oh, there you are. Hi. Are you here now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hi. Uh, so my name is Eric Marr. I'm an architect. Uh, I'm a resident, longtime resident, and also a business owner in Culver City. Um, and I, like Kim, favor uh, an all electric uh, reach code um, because, yeah, it's, we're well past time to uh, decarbonize. So I think the reasons are, are obvious and they're more obvious every day. That's the global comment. Um, for getting into the specifics, though, um, you presented multiple scenarios. I think you presented three all-electric scenarios. Um, I, I think that we need a little bit more nuance um, in them. So um, some of the points that Ron uh, brought up are, are valid. Um, I think that they, what he brought up were, if I'm, uh, if I can summarize, uh, he brought up problems with the um, electrical grid, which is mainly an S and E issue, and I think Joshua Torres addressed those. Um, he also brought up the uh, issue of point load uh, overload, and I think that is a uh, that's an electrical panel issue, and that's what breakers are supposed to address. So if there's a point overload at any one outlet or um, circuit, the breaker will trip. Um, that brings up the issue of many houses, existing houses, if you're going to do an ADU, really don't have the uh, capacity on the panel um, to accommodate um, the additional load. So um, if you're looking at EV car charging, you're really looking at a 240 volt um, circuit. So that would take up usually two breakers on the panel. Um, and then if you're looking at induction cooking, that's, that really should be a dedicated circuit. A heat pump has to be a dedicated circuit, possibly also 240 volts. And even with a 200 amp panel, you run out of space very quickly, okay? So that's a cost consideration that should be uh, taken into account. And I'm not sure what kind of, uh, kind of um, offset would be available. So, you know, with a lot of the um, sustainable technologies, whether it's low flow toilets, um, even heat pumps, there are, are rebates and subsidies that are available. Um, I think that we as a city should probably look into um, some of the kind of further on down upstream um, requirements that would also need to be met. Uh, the other thing, another point that Ron brought up, which is valid, um, is that PV by itself does not protect against blackouts. So you do need a battery backup system in order to uh, protect the house against a SCE power outage, which have become more frequent, to be perfectly honest. And uh, Josh, I know that this probably isn't something that you directly can address, but um, at least in my area in the Helms Arts, Arts District, it's at least once a year, if not more than once a year, okay? Um, now, in terms of requiring battery backups for, um, and I'm just referring to the residential area here, 
um, they're very expensive. Um, and they have a whole series of environmental issues in and of themselves. So even though I am very much in favor of most environmental initiatives, I think battery backups are probably not one that I would support, particularly because California just announced that by 2035, all new vehicles will have to be EVs. And EVs have the possibility of backfeeding the grid. So potentially, your car can be your battery backup. Um, in fact, I think the Ford F-150 Lightning already has that capability. And new uh, vehicles um, will probably be adding that as well. So I think we have to kind of think um, we have to we have to think in terms of what other industries are doing, what's likely to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, I think in general there's some things to be ironed out. Um, but in general, I would favor an all electric uh, reach code. Thanks. Okay. Um, our next speaker is David. David, I'll unmute you. Oh, one second, please. Okay. You can go ahead, David. Um, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah, my name is David Hockey. Um, Thirty-year resident of Culver City. Uh, I am fortunate enough to have solar panels on my rooftop, and an EV fast charging station. Um, that was installed for my electric vehicle. Um, I did, you know, as Eric was addressing, I did need to get a new, uh, whatever it is, um, a power panel installed to handle that elect entry increased electricity. Um, but um, since we're talking about new construction with the reach code, I would think and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that that kind of, um, you know, panels to handle the increased demand would be part of that new construction. Um, and so the reach codes do not apply to existing construction. Um, I am interested in the answer to Ron's question that he put in the chat, though. Um, at what point does a remodel become new construction and and when would you know, many, many homes in my neighborhood and around Culver City that are being torn down and and, and new construction is being put in, at what point would the reach codes apply to those um, new construction? But in summary, um, oh, and then I had one last question, which I'm happy to put in the chat as well. Uh, uh, the, the efficiency of the heat pumps I've heard is is affected by the humidity in the air, and I wonder because uh, I was considering at one point getting a heat pump for my home, and I wonder um, if if heat pumps in the LA area and, and specifically Culver City, uh, how efficient they are given our level of humidity near the ocean. Um, uh, but. But that's just sort of an arcane sort of esoteric question. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of reach codes. In fact, I would advocate for electric only plus efficiency so that Culver City can really continue to be a, a leader uh, in the area of, of sustainability and, and electrification. Thank you very much for the presentation today. Uh, I'm not really sure if Ron had another question that he can is raised, so I'll unmute him. Not at this time. Uh, not at this time. Enjoy hearing everybody else's comments. Hi, Lisa. This is Thanks. Tim. I'll take one of the questions on uh, generally the description of new construction. Um, right now, new construction would encompass projects that are all new ground up construction. Um, I have Nancy Barba. Uh, she raised her hand. I'm going to unmute her. Uh, go ahead, Nancy. 
is Nancy Barba, uh, and these what I'm about to share is my own. I am also the chair of the planning commission, but I'm voicing my support for the electric reach codes. Uh, the I think some of the questions and comments that are brought up on um, in objecting reach codes, many of them can be addressed by the data that the dozens, um, you know, I think it's up to nearly 100 cities across California have adopted reach codes uh, and are doing their electric new construction. New construction that is all electric is particularly in, in multifamily buildings, which um, is a type of building that Culver City wants to encourage to build because we have um, gets a huge housing shortage. It's actually more cost effective to build. Um, so I do want to mention that when you do a multifamily building, that means you're not going to have to do types for two type of energy sources. You only have to do it for electric. Um, I also in in you know by all means, I'm sure the consultants can address um, David's. Uh, question about humidity and heat pumps. Um, heat pumps need to be in an air conditioned space, typically a garage um, or inside your uh, home, the shell of your home. But I will let the experts kind of expand on that further. So just want to say um, support this, support the city doing this. I know they set on this path two years ago. Um, I heard, I understood you say that ADUs would be exempt from all electric. Can I hear a little bit about why that would be? Is it because it's not considered like a, is it to avoid inconveniencing the um, homeowner building the ADU or is it for some other reason? Hi, Nancy. Um First, could, just a point of clarification, um, if you could let us know if you're acting on behalf of the commission or if you're just acting as a, you know, as, as a resident or some other means. I couldn't unmute there. Um, no, 100% acting on behalf of myself and not the planning commission. Okay. That was the clarification Thanks. I was trying to make it at the beginning. These comments and my questions are completely my own. Oh, thank you for that. You know, as as we as as we look at some of these exceptions, and you know, just the overall reach codes themselves. You know, one of the big items. You know, um, as a policy maker, um, you know, we would like them to be cost effective. And in the past, uh, the study of you know an ADU it was hasn't been done as part of part of a cost effective study. I believe. Um, and they are being studied by the state IOUs at the moment. Now, you know, that we would want to see what those results are, you know, the cost effective studies, and then be able to, you know, make some determination on do we include those or do we not include those or, you know, how, how does it look like if there's an existing, you know, gas line or if there's no gas line, you know, what's the impact? of the construction cost and you know it is is it still effective or you know uh, some other members have brought up do they have to change the existing service you know what are the other uh, implications um to the demand of those so that, that's something that we're going to keep an eye out on um and it is a you know a potential you know these are like potential uh, exceptions that would have been compiled through um other past municipal codes from other cities from um, obstacles that they had run into and you know, ADUs has been one of them. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that. This is Melanie. Um, there, are a number um, of of all the cities that have adopted reach codes. There's, it's really kind of a it's a mix between cities that have exempted um, uh, ADUs and those who have included ADUs. Um, 
accessory dwelling units, um, they do have their own challenges as as Tim alluded to, uh, especially you know certain conditions, and that's why this special study was was commissioned. And so once we, um, you know, part of the the goal here is to solicit feedback from the community and and hear what the community has to say about specific items like ADUs, um, so that the you know the policy um, reflects you know uh, visions and goals. Um, so that's that's kind of the 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 idea there. Um, so and we will be learning a lot more about. Um, I mean, really, the cost effectiveness is a really big part of this. So um, when when it comes to a cost effectiveness study for ADUs, um, and it, it climate zones within California and all of and it's very um, robust the way that <clears throat> cost is measured and the effectiveness of these appliances is measured. Um, and so th these, the study that we're, we're anticipating very soon will answer a lot of those questions in terms of what the situation is for Culver City specifically. Um, and, and speaking to the, you know, the humidity question, yeah, the, so higher humidity um, outdoors will definitely impact the, the heat pump technology. Um, but and so like in an ideal situation is, is a moderate climate year round. Um, and there's degrees of, of effectiveness r related to that. Um, but n nonetheless, even with that, um, the, the cost effectiveness studies look at the, these 16 different climate zones and the performance of these appliances throughout the state. So it's gonna be a very different situation in the different parts of the state. We have many different geographical uh, realities in, in the state. So all of that is being considered um, as part of this effort. Okay, thank you. Um, Nancy, did, are you, did you wanna comment? No, okay. Uh, well, next we have Eric from the, we're gonna end one moment, please. Okay, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, hi, uh, you can hear again, right? Yes. Yeah, um, so my comments uh, previously were primarily about ADUs um, to address David Hockey's uh, question, you know, about new construction. So yeah, what uh, I'm seeing is that a lot of ADUs require panel upgrades um, because you know, obviously the electrical load is significantly increased. Um, and that becomes, that becomes a cost issue, it becomes a time issue. Uh, all of the above. So it was really all I was trying to do was to raise the point that um, as these things have ripple effects and we should take those into account. Um, now I favor uh, including ABUs in the reach code. Um, I don't think they should be exempted because for all of the, I mean, for the same reasons why the main residents should not be exempted. Um, ADUs can go up to, uh, what is it, 1,200 uh, square feet. So they're essentially the size of a typical um, uh, single family residence up until well into, into the 1970s and 80s. Uh, now, of course, the average size is a lot bigger, but if an ADU can be 1,200 square feet, it should definitely not be exempted from um, any all electrical reach code. Uh, then, let's see. Um, the I think that um, the new construction issue does come up when you do additions to an existing residential single family residential house. Um, so, I think that Culver City should consider if um, a new bedroom is added, for example, you know, there have to be some uh, kind of cutoff point beyond which the reach code would apply. So if you're just enlarging a room, um, maybe the reach code doesn't apply. But if you're adding a new bedroom, the reach code probably should kick in to some degree. Um, so again, some degree of, uh, of nuance um, would seem to be in order there. Um, yeah, that's, oh, and then one last thing, um, I think Melanie, you brought up multifamily housing. Um, so construction costs 
Uh, yes, it's true that you don't have to run multiple systems, but gas systems are actually pretty cheap um, to run because the piping isn't um, as expensive as running electrical, just from a pure construction standpoint. Um, and because solar panels are now required, that's um, a hefty upfront construction cost um, addition. So I think in the spirit of tying um, electrification into multiple other issues, the city should tie that um, to eliminating parking. So parking, as any developer can tell you, is one of the biggest costs um, that's associated with new uh, residential construction. And if parking were made, so parking minimums are basically a market intervention that is forcing developers to spend money on something which they may not actually need. So I think that um, the free market does have a place in certain um, parts of the economy and parking is one of those areas. So if Culver City got rid of parking minimums, which I know is something that's on the table, um, that makes all of the electrification a lot more palatable um, from an overall initial construction cost perspective. Um, so again, tie it into other things to ameliorate the cost impact. Thanks. Thank you. I'm not really sure. Okay, so Yvonne, did you have another comment? I, I, I couldn't tell whether your hand was up or not. Okay. I guess that's all the comments, probably. Okay, great. Um, well, thank thank you everyone for your participation in that. Um, uh, with that, we'll move to the next steps. Um, Layla, if you could cue the slides. Uh, can it, are you seeing the next step slide now? Just want to confirm. I am not, I am not seeing it. Yeah, the next step slide is it's, it's online. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Great. All right. Um, so uh, again, uh, thanks everyone for participating in uh, that discussion. Uh, Basically, in terms of next steps, uh, so the city is going to continue the development process for the local code. Um, this will, you know, be also based on the statewide uh, cost effectiveness studies that we mentioned as a part of the discussion today, um, and also based on the community and industry feedback that have come out of these engagement meetings. Um, the state, as I mentioned previously, is working to finalize the cost effectiveness studies um, and are anticipated to be released by the end of this month of August. Um, so we are watching that very closely um, with the next step after the cost effectiveness studies are finalized and the uh, outreach comes to an end will be to bring the reach code, the proposed reach code ordinance to city council um, for consideration and approval um, in October of this year. Um, and then after that, the city will need to undergo the state approvals and um, some of of the kind of statewide agency adoption process that we talked about at the beginning of our time together today, um, ultimately leading up to local enforcement and that effective date of January 1st, uh, 2023. Uh, so with that, um, we are going to close the public engagement meeting uh, for this evening, um, but if you have any uh, questions or feel called to revisit um, the, this presentation and some of the resources that we talked about today, um, please feel free to uh, visit the city's energy reach code uh, webpage, um, which will have some of the resources uh, that we discussed today, the presentation slides and what have you. Um, so again, uh, thank you so much for taking time uh, 
out of your day and your evening to be here with us and we really do appreciate your feedback um, and are grateful for your participation. Uh, we hope everyone has a fantastic night um, and um, enjoys the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie.